The first A28, the Mark I, we made in 1976. It was during the time that we were making sound systems for many of the theatres in London's West End. And we were building mixes in our little factory in Alexandra Road in, in Windsor. The first A28 was the result of a memorable meeting in my office. I remember it so, so clearly. During which we were, we were trying to understand why it seemed so difficult to produce a popular small mixer when it was obvious that there was a huge gap in the market between cheap amateur equipment and the sort of super expensive monsters we made for, for studios and theatres. And the result of all that, of course, was the, was the 828 that we now recognise and know. The last 828 from the Windsor factory was made in 1986, so the format lasted 10 years. The Mark I evolved into the 828S, which was designed specifically for broadcasting, and the Mark II, introduced in 1981, was a, was a redesign using integrated circuits, which were sort of newfangled things in those days. But they were all very successful, and they were all very heavy. A few years later, I started to get calls and emails from people who owned and used 828s, asking for advice helping with the maintenance, with, uh, with dirty pots, with um, replacement faders, things like that. The number of calls increased steadily over the years and I was amazed at the, the number of those old mixers that were still in use so many years later. I started to think about a reinvention of the old 828 uh, last summer in 2019. The pattern was clear. Many engineers loved the sound of the old Mark I. It added warmth and depth to productions done on digital workstations. For years I'd been using an old 828, uh, an old uh, made in 1980, a Mark I 828S. I was using it as, a, as an out-of-the-box mixer during production of albums of my wife Barbara. And now, with the popularity of that type of production, the 828 was absolutely ideal. As a serious project, a sort of a sort of retirement project, I suppose, I started an in-depth study of why the 828 sounds the way it does. The results are not simple, they're they're real and but definitely not imagination and not the result of any sort of hi-fi hype. I now recognise that factors that we used to think of as, um, as deficiencies in primitive transistor circuitry can be useful in sound reproduction and much of the perfection of circuits we now use is actually counterproductive. But now uh, this video is about a new 828 and, and not a geeky discussion about technology. The Mark III is, is still quite heavy at 7.2 kilograms and it's still painted dark grey and it has the famous White Rabbit logo. And the format that I chose for the first Mark III is the three mics and five stereo channels format. So now a quick tour around the mixer. To start at the beginning, first the input amplifier. The original mixer used a mic transformer made by either Sauter or Bellclear. The specs were the same. The transformer was mounted to the printed circuit board by solder tags and we did suffer from some problems with breakages if the mixer was dropped. The new one uses a transformer too of course and it's made by Oxford Electrical Products which took over the business of Bellclear. There's a built-in phantom power system of course from the mic, for the mic channels um, with a single switch which switches the power on. A transformer used to be the only sensible way to achieve a decent noise performance but as with so many factors in the mixer it also gave a certain sound that's missing from transformerless designs. The mic amp itself is a class A discrete design that has a has a massive overload margin. Present day mic amp designs work beautifully of course but designers overlook the fact that real sounds are made up of, of quite low level audio interspersed with spikes of very short duration and many times louder. The difference in volume is, is huge 
and high-performance designs have difficulty recovering from those momentary overloads. I'm talking about very fine points here. Of course, the, uh, a modern integrated circuit mic amp tends to sound just slightly thin, and it's really because of this effect. The discrete Class A design handles it all by just sounding slightly warm. <laughs> Both the mic and line level inputs route through the input transformer. From the input amplifier, the audio goes through the EQ or equaliser. Now, <laughs> I've often explained why it's called the equaliser. It was because during the early days of sound films, they had terrible problems making the, the dialogue sound the same from different microphones in different positions. It had to be equalised, and that's where the name came from. The 828EQ is particularly smooth. It was designed originally by Peter Baxendall, an electronics development engineer who worked for HMV in the 1950s. Versions of the circuit, they were used, it was used all over the place uh, in hi-fi amplifiers. Peter, unfortunately, he never, he never made a penny out of it. It's a very natural sounding EQ. It, uh, and if you want something extreme, then, well, it's probably better to use a digital EQ. But this one just it sounds nice and, and smooth and natural. Unlike the original Mark I, the Mark III has an EQ in-out switch. It's very necessary for comparisons. The channel fader is a familiar linear fader to give fine control of audio to the mixing bus. <laughs> bus. Now that's a word that's used a lot in audio mixing but it's often misspelt. It should have just one S. Two S's actually and you've got a Shakespearean kiss. The pan control routes the audio to anywhere between extreme left and extreme right in a continuous sweep. Back in the mid-1960s I designed a pan control like this for my own studio in KPM in Denmark Street. I believe it was one of, if not the first, continuous pan control in a London studio. And so to the actual mixing. And this is somewhere that the 828 is unique. It's a passive mixer. All modern mixers, except this one, mix using a virtual earth system. But during the development of the first 828, I realised that to retain the quality and the overload margins into the, the limiter section, I needed the audio level to be dropped considerably. And an easy way to achieve that is by simple passive mixing. The limiters are actually a part of the mixing system. <laughs> My favourite story about the, the limiters is about a, a, a visit I made many years ago to Pinewood Studios. I was being shown the big sound stage there with its gigantic Neve console that required three engineers to operate it. And there, sitting in the middle of the Neve, was an 828 and it was being used as a limiter for sounds on a Bond film. <laughs> it really is a, a very good limiter. Nowhere near as sharp or fierce as a, as a modern digital limiter of course, but very smooth. Technically it's a type of diode limiter similar to ones used by the BBC as a voiceover limiter on the radio. I stuck to the same original design because it's so easy and quick to use and it works well as the final control or even as a, a quite an exciting effects compressor. My idea for the A28 Mark III is that it should be used in conjunction with the digital workstation. Complex routing and extreme effects they can all be part of the digital system. The mixer just gives it a comfortable and easy to use way of, of final mixing and it's got a couple of auxiliary outputs it's got it's got decent metering it's got good quality monitoring with facilities like uh, mono and dimming a muting system built into the monitoring system for self op operation if it's used as a as a radio on air mixer so there you have it that's the 828 mark 3